Art Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Retro Radio, old-time radio in the dark. Here I bring you shows from the golden age of radio but still in the genre of my Weird Darkness podcast. I'll have stories of the macabre and horror, mysteries and crime, and even some dark science fiction, like what we'll be hearing tonight. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and be sure to subscribe or follow the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. Not only will you hear single episodes, such as what you're about to hear, but several days a week I also post 10-hour-long marathons of your favorite creepy old-time radio shows, like The Shadow, CBS Radio Mystery Theater, Inner Sanctum, and others. Perfect for binging all day or all night. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Spreading the word about the show helps it to grow. If you're here because you're already a fan of nostalgic audio and print, you'll want to email WeirdDarkness at RadioArchives.com. When you do that, you'll get an instant reply with links to download full-length pulp audiobooks, pulp ebooks, and old-time radio shows for free. That's WeirdDarkness at RadioArchives.com. Coming up, it's an episode from Dimension X. When the echoing Dimension X, 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 when you heard that, you knew you were about to be transported from your mundane, everyday existence somewhere completely different, possibly another planet. Dimension X featured stories from some of the most well-known science fiction writers at the beginning of their career, such as Robert Heinlein, Ray Bradbury, Kurt Vonnegut, and Isaac Asimov. The original stories were adapted by scriptwriters Ernest Kinoy and George Lefferts, as well as contributing their own original scripts. Before Dimension X, only one other adult-oriented science fiction show appeared on the radio, 2000 Plus, another show we have featured here on Retro Radio. But with the well-known writers involved, the show had almost instant credibility with science fiction fans. Radio was an excellent medium for science fiction in the 1950s. It was easy to visit other planets, interact with aliens, or fly in a spaceship in your imagination. It wasn't so easy to bring to life on TV in the 1950s. The show first aired April 8, 1950, and it completed its run on September 29, 1951, including a five-month hiatus in the middle. There were 50 episodes during the show's run. Tonight, it's the first episode of the show that was ever aired. Plus, it's a story that was so popular it was used more than once, many times, actually. After this original airing from April 8, 1950, the recording was broadcast again on Dimension X on September 8 of that same year, as well as on X-1 on November 16, 1955, also Suspense on February 15, 1954, and on March 17, 1957. The story script was also used on Escape on February 7, 1950, on Beyond Tomorrow on April 13, 1950, and Beyond This World on February 23, 1950. A similar script was used on Your Movie Town Radio Theater on December 17, 1947. So, yeah, apparently people really liked the story and its concept. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness as we listen to Dimension X from April 8, 1950 and The Outer Limit. Adventures in Time and Space Told in Future Tense Dimension X Can you predict what will come in 100 years, or in 10, or in the next minute? Some people think they can. Nuclear scientists, mathematicians, astronomers, biologists. They'll predict the shape of the future. 
Why? Because they make the future. Because they see beyond the known dimensions of time and space into the unknown dimension X. We go ahead now in time to 1965. We're on a vast concrete runway set in the desert of the Southwest. A giant metal ship stands before us, far pointed for the stars. And in five minutes, the signal will flash, and it will tear up through the atmosphere to the outer limit. Attention. Attention. Clear field for takeoff. Clear field. Five minutes, Steve. For right. takeoff. Clear her up, Charlie. I don't know, man. I want to go over the procedure again, Steve. Don't worry, I got it straight. You just make sure. Okay. I take her up on jets for 50,000, and I cut in the rockets. No lower, or your tail blast will burn out three counties. I climb four minutes on rockets, then start maneuver tests. Remember that, no more than four minutes. Right. This ship isn't like those strata rockets you've been testing. She's the first one built for outer space. If she works, she can go clear to the moon. But I know that, I'd have brought the tooth right about this trip. Now get this, Steve. You've got power there to clear the Earth's gravitational field. But remember, after you cut in the rockets, you've only got ten minutes fuel. If you go beyond the outer limit and don't save fuel for the return... I know, I won't get down again. That's right, Steve. You'll drift off into space. Get that now. Ten minutes fuel. Gotcha. As far as I'm concerned, this project is a lot more important than that cosmic ray bomb they're testing out in the Pacific tonight. Well, Security Commission grass doesn't think so. I don't see any undersecretaries under anything. Don't worry. In the long run, our ship will make the CR bomb back page stuff. But in the meantime, it's just as dangerous. Remember, half the principles of this ship are pure theory, Steve. Slide rule stuff. If anything goes wrong, we may have to scrape you off the landscape with a soup screw. You have a charming sense of humor. Well, here's what I'm getting at. We're risking your neck in this test. If anything blows, we don't want to have the next man pull the same boner. I know, Hank. So keep your mic open and keep talking. If anything goes wrong, we want to know exactly why. And we won't be able to ask you. Let us know before you pull every switch. Before you do anything. You got that? Yeah. Even if you only have to blow your nose. All right, get those fuel lines away. Okay, Mr. Grove. Well, I guess that's about all, Steve. Mm -hmm. That reminds me. Look, if Mary calls, I'm just up in a milk run. I didn't tell her today was it. How is she? She's okay, but she's due about now, and I don't want her to be nervous. Hey, I didn't know the baby was that close. Yeah. Steve, I, I really ought to be sending a single man on this job. Why, you cut me out of a soft paycheck? Forget it, Hank. You know, you can't get anybody else who can take 15 G's acceleration when those rockets cut in. Yeah, I know. It's time, Steve. Yeah. Well, see you later. Don't worry, Hank. I'll swim for both of us. Button her up, Shelly. Go on, Hank. So long. We'll give you the light from control. Okay, Steve. Got you on the speaker. I'm ready to go. Mr. Hanson. Ready on radar, Sergeant? Yes. Mr. Hanson, you better see this. What is it, Elsa? Message sent for Steve. Mrs. Weston just left for the hospital. What? Hello, Steve. Yeah. Stand by a minute. Shall we hold the takeoff, Mr. Hanson? What? Oh, yes. Uh, no, wait, wait just a minute. It's, uh, it's too late now. You going to tell him? Maybe he's good enough to worry about. Hey, what's holding us up, Hank? Something in your mind? No, no, it's, uh, it's nothing, Steve. I just wanted to say good luck. Clear for takeoff, Charlie? Right. Okay. Give him the light. All right, Steve. I'm reading you clear.
Still climbing. Altitude, 297 miles. All right, you're at the outer limit. Level off for maneuver test. You've got exactly six minutes fuel left. Okay. Starting at three degree left bank. It's a little sluggish. That's all right now. There's a low vibration someplace. Maybe the cockpit has. I'm straightening out. Five minutes fuel left. I'm starting at three degree. Ru hey! What's the matter? What's wrong? There's something up here. Something shiny. What are you talking about? There's something above me, Hank. I'm going to chase it. Steve! Steve, you're at the outer limit now. I can see it plain now. Steve, don't go any higher. You've only got four minutes left. You've only got. I'm getting static. I can't hear you, Hank. It's dead ahead now. I'm going to make a pass at it. Get a good look. Hey, it's swerving to meet me. It's better ahead now. It's better ahead. Hello. Hello. Hello, Steve. Steve, come in. Nine minutes, you're gone. Still no sign on radar. Hello. Hello, Steve. Steve, what's happened? Charlie, get out the crash squad. Tell the Army squadron to alert their search planes. Right. Nine and a half minutes gone. Right, Hello. Hello, Steve. Steve. What's happened? What well, the devil is going on? Hello. Come in, Steve. We need a search squadron. Come in. No, Mr. Hanson's busy. Hello. Hello, Steve. Hello, Steve. Ten minutes, Mr. Hanson. At the end of the fuel. <laughs> How long's it been now? Ten hours, Mr. Hanson. Nothing more on radar, Sergeant? Screen's blank. Colonel Corelli called in. Search planes are back. He didn't find anything. Should be some trace. He couldn't have bailed out, could he? You don't hit the circuit 4,400 miles an hour. He didn't even pass the outer limit without a fuel. Something blew and we'll find the pieces scattered from here to the coast. Why does it have to be the best man? Always the best man. I'll get it. Charlie, no, Charlie, we, you know, we've got to no, figure no. out what was wrong. No. Something, something must have blown. Yeah. There's a message from Northside Hospital for, for Steve. Well, what is it? Mrs. Weston's fine. It's a boy. Thank you, Elsie. It's a boy, Charlie. Oh, fine, fine. It's a boy. He didn't even know she went to the hospital. How am I going to tell Mary that? It wasn't your fault, Mr. Hanson. Ship had to be tested. Yeah, yeah, we'll build another one, and some other flying fool will shoot past the outer limit into space. Oh, I'm getting old, Charlie. You can remember when I used to take him up myself. Now I've got to send other men. It's a job, Mr. Hanson. Now I'm afraid. Every time I hear a jet go off, I jump. Every time I have to send someone up in a new model, I start to sweat. Mr. Hanson. Yeah? I think there's something on the radar. No flights scheduled in either, Elsie. We have the whole bay cleared. It's coming in behind us. Here it comes over the building. What crazy junk is buzzing the field like that? Is that an army plane, Charlie? I can't see. It's turning. Charlie, alert the field. I know that engine. Steve. That's impossible. That's a ship. It can't be. Well, there's no other model like that. It's Steve, all right. It's coming in. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> Done the quicker 
Parker, you get over to see Mary and the baby. Hank. Elsie, give the order to check and refuel the rockets. I don't want anybody in here till I get Steve's reports. Barry, any calls? All right, let's have it. What the devil have with you? Hank, does that cosmic ray bomb still go off tonight? What are you talking about? Straighten out, Steve. Where you been for the last ten hours? Listen, Hank. There's something more. I'm come on, come on. I've got to get a report on the screen to Washington, so let's have it. I've got to know how you stretch ten minutes fuel to keep you in the air for ten hours. Now, one thing before I talk. Look, have the Geiger men run over the ship before they refuel. What did you run into? So help me, Hank. I don't know. We better check and make sure it isn't radioactive. Elsie, add a Geiger report on the standard check. Steve, maybe we better have the doc look you over too. No, no, I'll be all right. They said I'd be all right. They? Look, son, I know you've had a tough time, but we've had this field on the alert for ten hours. One of the army boys cracked up looking for you, and he's hurt bad. So let's have a story. Let's have it straight. <laughs> I don't know how to tell you. Hank, I saw something up there. At 300 miles. I chased something up there, Hank, and I caught it. Now, don't hand me that. Listen to you. I was cruising along, just starting the right bank, when I spotted something. It must have been going about half my speed. It was egg-shaped and smooth. I made a pass at it, and I was coming back for another, and then there was a humming sound. Humming? A sort of vibration. And I blacked out. I was headed straight for it at 4,400 miles an hour. I thought it was going to be the biggest smash since Hiroshima, and... I guess I was drinking that bottle. Never mind that, Steve. What happened? I came to inside their ship. Uh-huh. Steve, this whole thing has been a devil of a strain on you. I'm going to call Major Donaldson from the Army base. Ask him to sit in. Psychiatrist? Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Let him run his tests. He'll tell you I'm not kidding. Because, Hank, unless I miss my guess, I've just been tipped off to the way the world ends. <laughs> All right, Mr. Weston, suppose you continue your story. Yes, let's have it, Steve. You woke up inside the ship? Yes, and uh, the place was jammed with machinery. Hmm. Dials, blinkers. I couldn't recognize anything. And you were surrounded by these men from Mars. I didn't say anything about men from Mars. I didn't even say they were men. I couldn't see them clearly. They, they were just there. Where did they come from, then? Another galaxy. Millions of miles outside of our solar system. That's all I know. You figure out where they came from. And they came all that distance to find the Earth? Yes. Did they tell you that? Yes. You mean they spoke English to you? No, no, they didn't. That's funny. I hadn't thought. They didn't really speak to me at all. They just planted the thoughts in my mind. You mean thought transference, telepathy? Yes, that's right. Well, Steve, what brought them here? We did, Hank. We rang their bell. We brought them in. Wow. With our atomic explosions. Hank, that's why you've got to stop that bomb test tonight. Uh, I'll give up. Look, you've got to believe me, Hank. Oh, how can I make you understand? Maybe I can help, Mr. West. Would you submit to narcopsychometry? What's that? Under proper drugs, I can put you back in this uh, ship. By suggestion. Then we can get a playback record of your memory pattern on the audio circuit. How long will that take? Half an hour. We'll have to go over to the lab. Will you believe me if it checks? It will give us an accurate memory picture of what your mind reports. All right, let's go. Hank, you've got to believe me. We haven't got much time. You should be getting drowsy now. Count backwards from ten. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Six. He's under. Now we attach the head plate electrodes. The cortical pickup. Look out for that wire, Mr. Henson. Three old setting, 31.3. Now throw that switch, Mr. Henson. I have to start him off by suggestion. 
All right, Steve. You're in your ship now. You're in the rocket. Rocket. You're in the rocket. You're in the rocket. And you've just sighted something strange. Now I'm starting at three degree right. What's that? Hey, there's something up here. Something shining. His memory pattern. They're picking it up electronically. There's something above me, Hank. I'm going to chase it. It's piped through the audio circuits. I'm getting static. I can't hear you, Hank. This is where we lost contact with him. I'm going to make a pass at it and... Hey, it's swerving to meet me. It's not ahead now. It's not ahead. No, but this is where he blacked out. There's no telling how long, minutes or hours. What's that noise? I don't know, Claire. Where? How did I get in here? What? Who are you? Is he seeing things? Intergalactic patrol. What's that? What are they saying, Steve? What are they saying? It's about nuclear fission. They know about it. They know the danger of it. Long ago, they had wars that almost destroyed them. But finally, they learned. Now they've outlawed war. Go on, Steve. They patrol space. When their detector picks up an atomic explosion, they send a patrol. What are they going to do? They've quarantined us. Quarantined? They've isolated the Earth because we don't know how to control ourselves yet. But until we learn, will be a menace to the whole universe. What is this nonsense? How are they going to do it, Steve? They've spread a layer out here of... I don't know how to call it. All around the Earth. It's miles deep. When there's an atomic explosion on Earth, the radioactive particles will drift up to this layer and set off a chain reaction. It'll go around the world in microseconds. And that's the end. Yeah, what's he... Wait, wait. Yes? Yes, I understand. I've got to bring back the warning. You're going to put me back in my ship to bring the warning. Now what? Like that again. I guess that's all. What does all that mean? It's what he remembers. You don't think that really happened? No, no. Narcosychometry circuits produce what he remembers. It just means that Steve believes this happened. I don't uh, like to see this. Uh, I've seen too many top pilots uh, snap. Steve is the best I've known. How bad do you think he is? Frankly, outside of the presence of this well-organized this hallucination, there's no sign of unbalance. It may not be too serious. If he had a more plausible story, I'd be inclined to believe him. Warning. Hank, it's all right, boy. Did you hear it, Hank? You understand? Sure, sure. We've, we've been quarantined. Let me give you something to make you sleep, Steve. Don't you understand? They fixed it so that if we set off one more nuclear explosion, that'll be it. Of course. Don't roll your sleep down. You don't believe me. Now, take it easy, Steve. Look at Preston Light. They're setting off the CR bomb. Hank, what time is it? 11.20. Well, it's scheduled for midnight. I think we got to stop that bomb. Steve, let Donaldson give you the high probe. Hank, you've got to believe me. I saw them. I got the warning. If we touch off that bomb tonight, it'll be the biggest galactic 4th of July of all time. The whole Earth will go up like a Roman candle. April 10th, 1965, the end. Now, look, Steve, you better calm down. Don't you want to see Mary and the baby? You've got a new son, remember? Yeah, that's just it. I, I want to see my son. I want him to live. If that bomb goes off... Hank, we've got to stop them. Mr. Hanson, I think we'd better get over to the base hospital. Hank, you've got to believe yeah, me. Sure, sure, Steve. Maybe there is something to it. Look, it's out of your hands. I'll put it in a report and shove it into Washington in the morning. In the morning? There isn't going to be any morning, Hank. Don't you understand? You've got to call Washington now. Get the head of the security commission and postpone that test. No, you know I can't do that, Steve. My neck would be out a mile. Besides, this is 1965, not 45. Twenty countries have atomic bombs now. What's the use of stopping just this one? The rest will keep right on popping the Well, we'll have to call an international conference. Can't you understand, Hank? The first one that goes off finishes us at the end. They've given us the quarantine warning. Steve, I think you'd better go with us to the base hospital. <laughs> Look, Steve, we can call up for a detail if we have to. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll go with you. 
You don't need a straight jacket. That's the way, Steve. You'll probably feel better by morning. Let's go. Well, Steve, tomorrow I'll drive you over to the hospital to see Mary and the kid. Sure. Look at the ship under the floodlights. Pretty, huh? You'll be flying her again soon, don't you worry. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Uh, what you doing out in the line? The, uh, refueler? Yeah, we got Clausewitz coming in tomorrow from Denver for another test. I figure we'd give you a day off. That's good. That's fine. Steve! Steve, come back! Come on, Donaldson. Steve! Steve, wait! He's heading for the rocket. Look, there he goes up. That crazy fool. We can't get at him now. That covers armor glass. He's waving. Yeah, towards control. It's the radio. He needs the radio. Come on. I should have gotten help. Yeah, the radio's still hooked up here. Hello. Hello, Steve. Listen to me, Hank. You gotta call Washington now. Come out of that rocket, Steve. I'll call my men. Don't try anything, Hank. They refueled the rocket for tomorrow. Take it easy, Steve. Listen, you know what'll happen when I fire the rocket tubes down here? He don't. It'll burn out every building for five miles. All of us in one big blast. Steve, what do you want? You've got to stop that bomb. You've got to call Washington right now. They won't believe me. You make that call or I cut in the rocket. Now, I mean it, Hank. Now, hook my screen to yours in parallel. I want to see exactly what you're doing. All right, all right. Just don't fire those rockets. Get going, Hank. You've got 12 minutes to make that call and stop that bomb. All right, I'm making the parallel hookup right now. Donaldson, you think he'll really blast? I don't know. Up to now, I don't want to say it was normal, but now he's liable to do anything, Hanson. Steve. Steve, there. Are you getting it on your screen? Yeah. Now, put that call through. All right. Operator. Visa screen to Washington. The visa screen circuits are busy, sir. If you'll try again in half an hour. This is security commission priority. Break in. Get me a line. Yes, sir. Just a moment, please. Ten minutes, Hank. Listen, Steve, I'm trying. I'm ready to take your call, sir. Uh, Washington, security commission three. This is urgent. I want Undersecretary Herbert Ames. Washington, three. One moment, please. Hurry, will you? One moment, please. What time is it, Donaldson? 11.51. Do you think he'll fire those rockets? He might. Washington? There's a screen three. Mr. Herbert Ames, please. That is a coded exchange. I cannot accept your call without clearance. Get it through, Hank. Listen, Washington, put it through. This is Mr. Hansen at San Marco Air Base. This is a priority call. I'm coded. One moment, please. I will check your code number. Get that through, Hank, and that bomb goes off at 12. Will you be reasonable, Steve? Your call has cleared, San Marco. Washington, this is screen three. Herbert Ames, please. Security Commissioner Ames. Listen to Ames. Hello, Ames. Ames, you've got to get me to the chief. Are you kidding? He's at the test control room. Yes, I know, but get him for me. What's up? You look lousy. Or is it a bad circuit? There's no time. I've got to get him before the test. It's about the CR bomb. I can take that responsibility. Get that through, Hank. Right, glad. Hey, what's going on there? Ames, my project has a high enough rating. This is a priority A call. What? Well, okay, it's your neck. I'll try to get him for you. He's in the control room, so you'll have to switch off your screen and speaker and go on earphones. Too much going on in there. Security you hear that, Steve? I've got, I've got to cut the incoming screen. All right. But don't try anything. Eight minutes, Hank. Hello. Hello. What? You got him, Hank? Yes. This, this is Hanson at San Marco. No, sir. Priority A request to cancel the bomb test. No, no. I'm serious. This is deadly serious. We sent the X-2 JTR up today to the outer limit. We uncovered evidence. Yes, on the automatic instruments. What's that? No possible chain reaction. No, I, I can't tell you the whole story. There isn't time here. Yes, yes, I, I'll bring the readings into Washington in the morning. You've got to postpone the test till you see them. Look, I worked on contracts for the commission for 10 years. Yes, yes, I have complete confidence in my information. You can record that. All right, I, I'll call you back immediately. Bye. Thank you. Hank? He's agreed to cancel, Steve. The bomb won't go off. All right, boy. You can come down out of that ship. He's opening up. Here he comes. All right, Steve. Come on down. Sure, Hank. Just a second. 
Hank, I was scared. I was plain scared. He's in the all over. The bomb won't walk. Thank God. Look, uh, I want to see Mary and the baby. Can you get me transportation now? Oh, wait a minute, it's almost 12. They won't let you in the hospital now. I want to see the baby. Sure you do, but you've been under a strain. I've got a shot for you here, Steve. Give you a good night's sleep. All right. Roll up your sleeve. Yeah, yeah. There. Yeah. There, yeah, I'll make you sleep. Sergeant will find you a bed. Yes, sir. Come on, Mr. Weston. Okay. Good night, Hank. I'm kind of beat. It's been a tough night. It sure has. I thought for a minute he was going to blast those rockets and send us all to Kingdom Come. Yeah. Quite a stunt getting the ray bomb test called off. It isn't called off. But the chief said... James couldn't get the chief. I was talking to a dead circuit. Bomb goes off in a couple of minutes. Oh. Poor Steve. He was one of the best. He was the best. One in ten million. Some story of this poor guy. For a while, he almost had me believe in that quarantine. That's a very common illusion. End of the world. Yeah. I suppose so. Ah, it's a nice night. <laughs> Never saw the stars so bright. We better be getting in. That wind is cold. Well, the bomb goes off in 30 seconds. Poor Steve. You know, Henson, there's just one thing. Yeah? It's outside my field, but I'm curious. How did he keep that ship in the air for 10 hours with only 10 minutes fuel? You have just heard The Outer Limit by Graham Dorr, an adventure in time, space, and the unknown dimension. <laughs> about next week. Have you ever heard of the Mark III, the amazing electronic brain at Harvard that instantly solves the most complicated scientific problems? Suppose you had a mechanical brain like that in your house, a robot that was always at your service so that you could just sit with folded hands and relax the rest of your life. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Perfect. That's what they thought when it happened in the year 2006. But they were wrong, terribly wrong. How? I'll tell you next week. Tonight's story, transcribed on Dimension X, The Outer Limit by Graham Dorr, was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Joseph Julian as Steve, Wendell Holmes as Hank, and Joe DeSantis of Major Donaldson. Your host is Norman Rose. Music was by Albert Berman. Sound designed by Sam Monroe. Edward King directed. Tomorrow, here's Sam Spade. Now it's Truth or Consequences on NBC. Thanks for listening to Retro Radio, old-time radio in the dark. If you want even more from the golden age of broadcasting, you'll want to check out my daily audio-only podcast, also named Retro Radio, old-time radio in the dark. Not only will you get single episodes like you've just heard, but also 10-hour-long marathons of your favorite strange and macabre old-time radio shows, several days per week. Marathons of shows like CBS Radio Mystery Theater, The Shadow, Inner Sanctum, and more. You can find Retro Radio, old-time radio in the dark, at WeirdDarkness.com slash Retro Radio. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Retro Radio. 
or look for Retro Radio Old Time Radio in the Dark wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you just heard, please share this episode with someone you know who also loves Old Time Radio and Pulp Audio. If you want to hear even more, drop an email to WeirdDarkness at RadioArchives.com and get an instant reply with links to download full-length pulp audiobooks, pulp ebooks, and old-time radio shows absolutely free. That's WeirdDarkness at RadioArchives.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll see you next time for Weird Darkness's Retro Radio, old-time radio in the dark. Retro Radio.